Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Mandalorian is out, and for all of you diehard Star Wars fans out there, I can say it's definitely worth checking out. It's still too early to judge whether the series is going to be good or not. I am a little worried about Dave Filoni transitioning from animation to directing live action actors. But as far as the world and story goes, you can definitely sense that Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni are basically the biggest Star Wars nerds in the world, which is an awesome thing. J.J. Abrams was also a huge fan, but it always felt like he was too afraid to add anything to the franchise. And Ryan Johnson says he's a fan as well, but that's kind of suspect. I know we Star Wars fans are very hard to please, but that's only because we love the franchise so much. But anyway, what we see with Favreau and Filoni are two fans who also happen to be skilled creators who are willing to experiment and delve into the unknown parts of Star Wars lore that we've always wanted to know about. They're basically the Goldilocks mama bears of Star Wars creators. And plus, TV shows nowadays are basically produced with the same quality as films, so yeah, highly recommend you check it out for yourself. Now, as a hardcore Mandalorian fan who enjoys wearing Kaminoan skin gloves, I immediately caught on to some old Legends details in the first episode that surprised me in a really good way. With the Clone Wars and Rebels cartoons, Disney and Lucasfilm were able to experiment a little with the Mandalorians. They brought in the pacifist new Mandalorian arc and later the Civil War period on Mandalore during the Galactic Civil War. But in these two cartoons, we never get a real coherent view on what it means to be a Mandalorian. But in the Mandalorian TV show, we are introduced to Beskar and Beskar forging, the concept of foundlings, and many other important aspects of Mandalorian culture that really haven't been talked about outside of the expanded universe, which is exactly the kind of stuff I want to see in a Mandalorian-focused TV show. And so today I thought we would take a look at the Mandalorians and focus on how one becomes a Mandalorian, because not all Mandalorians are actually born Mandalorians. But before we begin, guys, make sure to check out our second channel, Generation Films, where we'll also be talking about all sorts of Mandalorian and Star Wars content. We've linked it in the top right corner. There's just way too much content coming out from Star Wars to put on just one channel, and plus we'll get to see American Ben's opinion on Star Wars as well as my own. Unlike most races and factions in Star Wars, the Mandalorians were founded around a set of ideas and culture rather than which planet they hailed from or what species they were, which made them kind of ahead of their time. Legends say that the first Mandalorians weren't even humans, instead they were a species known as the Tong, who originated on the planet of Norton, known today as Coruscant. The Tong, who strangely looked a lot like predators, were constantly at war with the 13 human tribes known as the Zell. The Tong were vicious fighters and physically superior to the human beings, but ultimately they were outnumbered and driven off of Coruscant. They traveled from one place to another until they reached the planet now known as Mandalore. Tens of thousands of years before the Battle of Yavin, the warlord Mandalore I would unite the Tuang, who had rebranded themselves as the Mandalorians. The Mandalorians could be identified by their Crusader armor. Mandalore was home to an extremely rare mineral known as Viscar. Mandalorian smiths would work this metal into a special alloy which could resist blaster bolts and even stop lightsabers. It was one of the most expensive materials in the galaxy and could only be found on Mandalore and its moon, and it was a very important part of Mandalorian culture. Eventually, the Mandalorians would start launching great crusades against neighboring worlds and quickly started taking over a lot of territory. Their society could almost be described as nomadic because they were constantly traveling from one planet to another in great war parties, kind of like the great Mongol hordes or the Dothraki. And through their travels, the Mandalorians would basically accept any warrior that was worthy of becoming a Mandalorian. It didn't matter what species you were, as long as you could fight, honor the code, and have a body that could fit inside of some plated armor. There's an entire Mandalorian code of honor as well that kind of explains everything in case you're interested. We'll also link that video in the top right corner. Now, the Mandalorian culture was really anti-bureaucratic and more about self-responsibility and reliance. Every warrior was expected to manage their own affairs, supply themselves with food and whatever else they needed. This also carried into battle. Although they were highly disciplined soldiers, there was really no ranks amongst the Mandalorians. Instead, the most experienced veterans would generally lead the less experienced. The Mandalorians would occasionally organize themselves into units, but generally speaking, everything they did was pretty organic and really lacked any oversight. They depended heavily on the fact that most Mandalorians would follow the Code of Honor. Also, everyone was heavily armed with like knives, blasters, explosives, so it's not a real good idea to step out of line anyway. Now, Mandalorian society was 
pretty tough. There was constant warfare and violence and fighting, but it was also a surprisingly egalitarian society. The Mandalorians didn't really care about how wealthy you were or what your species were, as long as you followed the code, mutual respect was given. Now, the classic Mandalorian Crusader period was just one point on the wider Mandalorian timeline. Throughout its history, the Mandalorian faction would fluctuate from loosely united war clans to galactic-wide hordes and empires. Each iteration of the Mandalorians would heavily change the structure of their society. But generally speaking, throughout most of their history, it was pretty easy to walk on and try out as a Mandalorian. Mandalorian. Whether you walked out alive was a whole other story, though. You also had periods like the Neo-Crusader era, which resulted in the greatest rise and fall in Mandalorian power. Under the leadership of Mandalore the Ultimate, the Neo-Crusaders formed an enormous army and invaded Republic space in what would be known as the Mandalorian Wars. Due to the sheer size of their invasion army, the Mandalorians had to become uncharacteristically organized and set up a standardized armor, and they also started conscripting. Whenever the Neo-Crusaders took over another world, which they did a lot, they would give the Republic civilians three options. Either join the Crusades as a fighter or serve as a essentially slave in one of their war factories or just die. This was kind of a dark time for the Mandalorians as the quality of these conscripts significantly decreased the effectiveness of their fighting force. Amongst their new recruits were cowards, sociopaths, and criminals that didn't really follow the Mandalorian Code of Honor. Which was a problem because the Mandalorian battle plan and social structure heavily depended on the individual's ability to self-govern. Then the Jedi would join the Republic side in the war and suddenly the Neo-Crusaders were retreating across the galaxy. A Jedi known as Revan had risen amongst the Republic ranks and was obsessed with defeating the Mandalorians and ultimately killed Mandalore the Ultimate and hid his mask, which, like the Darksaber, was an important symbol for Mandalorian leadership. So the Mandalorian faction would never truly recover from their defeat during the Mandalorian Wars. And although various Mandalorian factions would rise and fall afterwards, they would never as a people obtain as much influence as the new Crusaders did. But Mandalorians were still well respected and highly sought after as mercenaries and bounty hunters. Now, the term foundling comes up in the new Mandalorian TV show. It's not a term we've ever heard of in Star Wars lore, but it does have a root in Legends Mandalorian lore. Foundling, by definition, is a child who has been left by their parents and found and cared for by other people. The bounty hunter in The Mandalorian was orphaned or separated from his parents after the Confederacy of Independent Systems attacked their world, which is probably why he doesn't like droids. He was later found and adopted by the Mandalorian faction. Now, this is a pretty cool piece of Mandalorian tradition that dates to the true Mandalorian faction. Around 60 years before the Battle of Yavin, a Mandalorian known as Jaster Muriel took up the position of Mandalore and established the Super Commando Codex. Yester was a pretty smart dude and realized that if the Mandalorians were going to continue to work as contractors, they would need to better define their brand. The Super Commando Codex basically set out guidelines for how a Mandalorian mercenary should act while on the job. At the time, other factions, like the Death Watch, were pretty much running around and gunning down everyone, trafficking slaves, and mixing Chinese-made fentanyl into their spice and selling it to children. They were really bad dudes, and so the Super Commando Codex was an attempt to rein in their behavior and reestablish the Mandalorian. Mandalorian brand as family friendly. Well, not family friendly, but you know, like safe. The Death Watch faction would continue to be a thorn in the side of the true Mandalorians, and during one battle on the world of Concord Dawn, the Death Watch attacked a homestead and murdered an innocent couple who happened to be the parents of Jango Fett. Yasha Muriel rescued young Jango and immediately sensed something special about the boy and adopted him. He would give Jango a typical Mandalorian upbringing, which was full of martial training, warfare, and tough love. He treated Fett as if he were his own son and would groom him for leadership. This practice of adopting orphans from the battlefield would become an important part of the true Mandalorian faction's culture, and it would be an important part of Mandalorian recruitment in the future. Although some Mandalorians were married and had families and children and settled down on Mandalore, an even greater number wandered the galaxy fighting for coin. Adoption was their way to pass on their legacy and also a way to do a good deed. But of course, just like the Mandalorians of old, not all children would be selected, only the ones who showed that they had some fight in them. Another famous Mandalorian known as Cal Skirata was also recruited into the Mandalorians in this way. At the age of six, Skirata lost his entire family and learned to adapt to living in an active war zone. He was eventually found by a Mandalorian named Moonin Skirata. Well, actually, the young boy found him first and tried to stab him in the face with a knife, which really amused Munin. 
And so the Mandalorian would go on to adopt him and even gave him his name, Cal Scarada. Cal means blade in Mandoa. Now, it seems like by the time of the Clone Wars, this practice of adopting children uh, in Mandalorian culture has become even more established and more structured. The orphans are now called foundlings, and it seems like there is an organization within the Mandalorians that actually handles the adoption process of these war refugee children. The bounty hunter in the TV show even donates some of his Beskar to sponsor new foundlings. Beskar, as we mentioned, is basically one of the most expensive metals in the galaxy. And if you are curious about how much that brick is worth, well, you should check out Generation Films again because that's what our episode on Sunday is going to be. We're going to try to figure out exactly how much Beskar is worth in real life currency. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed our kind of video about how Mandalorians become Mandalorians. It's, as you can see, it's a really interesting faction. There are a lot of, uh, you know, kind of legends things that I hope that Favro and Filoni and all the other guys working on the Mandalorian will bring back. Anyway, guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.